Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 687. Episode number 687 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing fine wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing awesome. How am I? You know how it is. All good, all things considered. I cannot complain. I really, really cannot complain. This past weekend when I went out, right, I remembered something that happened that I forgot to mention. Usually, or in the past, I've been known to be somebody that loses a bunch of stuff, loses a bunch of things, items go missing. It's just one of the things that I tend to do. And it's annoying because it's not only a consequence of me getting absolutely mash up. It's just me being forgetful, not paying attention and not really kind of, you know, knowing my surroundings. And these days I kind of go out of my way to kind of be very mindful of my surroundings, checking my shoulders, looking up, looking down, noticing if I trip on something, if something feels weird in my pocket and it feels lighter, whatever it may be, I'm kind of always on job now. So for all those occasions that I lost something and it broke my heart, it's actually now taught me to be a little bit more attentive and to keep my eye open on things even if I am mash up especially if I'm not mash up now when I went out to this flipping club the other day to go and see Freddie K perform at E1 I wasn't even at mash up I had like a half a bottle of coca-cola filled up with some spiced rum nothing too crazy I was drinking that on the way to the club cycling so I wasn't getting super mash up because I was really going for it and making sure I was getting a good sweat in so I wasn't really kind of you know getting drunk as I probably would if I was sitting down somewhere and then when I got there I didn't have one drink in there I just had some water and that was it so I wasn't mash up in the slightest. I was very attentive, very aware of my surroundings and all sorts. But somehow when I ended up leaving there around like half three, four AM, I rock up to my bicycle to go and unlock it. I start searching for my keys in my little Supreme side bag. And guess what? No keys. I'm like, no way. No bloody way did I come out to this place with this whole plan. I'm going to come here, record some footage, hang out, catch a vibe, uh, check certain DJs that are playing and then go home early. No way under these circumstances am I going to be the person who has lost their keys. And I was like, oh my days, this is absolutely crazy. So I started patting around my body, couldn't find it, looking in my fucking pockets for 7 million times. And I thought, you know what, let's go back to the club and see, just in case. And it's not likely that you find it because there's been plenty of occasions and I've got a whole box full of random assortments of things like a little key, somebody's driver license, like little things that you pick up when you're out and about and you have the mind like I do. I always have the intention of handing it into flipping lost property, but sometimes you just forget or you're just like having fun doing your thing and it just kind of passes you by and then by the time you're on home on the Uber on the way back home, you check your pockets like, oh my God, who the fuck is Pablo? I mean, who the fuck is this light? Who the fuck does this key belong to? You're like, shit. And it's a bit too late to then kind of go back and return it. And that person most likely has canceled their card. Whatever. I mean, all these things that happen. So I wasn't really optimistic about finding my keys in there. Before you know what, let me give it a chance. So I rock back inside. I go through the whole flipping, pleading with the security guards to let me back into the club. Because one thing about London clubs, for whatever reason, once you're in, you're in. They don't let you back inside. I don't know why this is the case, what that culture is about. Um, and it's not even a time thing. It doesn't matter what time you go into a club. Most clubs don't actually allow re-entry. I've never really understood why that is. Maybe it's because they're afraid of you coming back in weapons or something, but they could just research you. It's not that big of a deal. But some reason, they don't like people coming back in a club after they left. So I'm trying to get back in. I look the way I look. So they probably think I've got something on me. I convince them I don't. And then uh, I get told, hey, go to a cloak and you might find it and i go to the cloakroom and the cloakroom is the most like you know the cloakroom in e1 is the most i would say minimal looking cloakroom there's not a lot of like you know stuff around there's just a whole bunch of rails behind the people that do the cloakroom stuff and a completely empty desk um with the exception of a till so if you don't see anything to your naked eye there most likely it's not there and i was like oh my god I'm looking around i was like there's hardly anything here they've just got people's coats inside and there's members that are putting the coats in there staff members that are putting the coats in there and there's a till on this table and that's it there's no like box with missing shit there's nothing it's just like that it's just minimal and then i did the whole like embarrassing like sorry to ask this but do you have you seen the pair of keys and the first thing he did was le was lean over and pick up some keys next to the till and immediately when i heard the sound i knew they were mine i'm like oh my god thank you thank you thank you and then obviously i had to go through some little you know proving it was mine little test about what's on the key ring and da, da, da. but 
it was such an amazing feeling to go back to the club and find my keys, especially, like I said, because I really wasn't on a mad one. I was on a chill one. I was relaxing, having a good time. I went to leave early to kind of get some food on the way back and just chill. And then suddenly I'm feeling like I lost my, my flipping keys. But luckily I didn't and I found them and I got them. But all this to say, I did have a lot of good karma coming my way due because there's been plenty of times in the last I think a few months even with the exception of going to Fifth in Berlin where I found stuff like scarves wallets and stuff and I handed it back and I think this is the karma that I get for it don't get me wrong wallets are probably way more precious than keys but for me having to get a new set of keys done I've got a particular fob for my apartment that needs to be approved by the people that own the house association and shit they have to send it to you you can't just go and get made a copy of it um and yeah I just you know just don't want to lose my keys for no reason so when I did find them I was like oh my god this is definitely good karma for all those times I've handed in driver's license wallets scarves hats bags so I was really happy that that happened and I was able to kind of um, get my keys and then hop on my bike and ride home it really really made me happy um so if you are one of those people that you know goes on you know if you're one of those people that kind of excuses taking people's things because they lost them I really do recommend you not to do that um try and be a try and kind of set a good example um just for the universe not even in terms of you basically getting something back but it does feel great when it does come back to you i can't lie man honestly i really really can't lie so i was really really happy and ecstatic about that so big up e1 for having a good lost and found property place Talking about lost and found, some absolutely crazy news developments so far. Um, Andrew Tate and his brother have finally been charged. You know, for the longest time, they weren't being charged and they are being held with no real um, idea on when they were going to get free anytime soon. They weren't, they was, there was no charges against them. The Romanian officials or the Romanian you know, court system just kept prolonging and adding more dates um, onto the time that they were being in prison for because they wanted to do more investigations. And then eventually the Tate brothers ended up um, getting out of prison and being on house arrest um, whilst the investigation is still rumbling on, which is a bit of a strange way to kind of approach it. But, you know, every country has got their way of doing stuff. But essentially they have their suspicions. They didn't make the charges yet or didn't have all the evidence that they needed. And then they kind of had the these guys um you know sitting down basically fearing for their lives whilst they kind of put the case together the last few bits a bit strange it doesn't really usually happen that way in most countries usually they kind of you know once they arrest you they've already got the case kind of you know sealed and ready to go to the courts essentially but it doesn't work out in romania but a lot of people myself included have been thinking where the smoke there's fire with the Andrew Tate guys, right? Or and his brother, Tristan. Um, there might be some truth to what they're saying because it seems that like the Romanian government are really going at them and really hard and aggressive. But then you sit down and you listen to Andrew Tate and Tristan Tate talk. Um, you hear corroborating stories from other people in and around them. And you come to the way of the conclusion that most likely this Andrew Tate guy is a bit of a douchebag, so is his brother. But are they actually capable of the crimes that they've been accused of? Are they as monstrous as the press is trying to paint them out as to be? I'm just not too sure. Yes, would it be, if you're a parent, would you be super happy with your kid listening to the rhetoric that's coming out of these guys? Maybe, maybe not, I'm not too sure. There's plenty of other bad influences out there outside of people like this anyway, especially in the mainstream media. Let's not even try and fake that. So I understand people's reservations towards them, but it's just more so along the lines of, do I sit here and say that I could believe them being part um, of a human trafficking ring organization in terms of organized crime and being involved in raping people and stuff? I'm not really too sure. Um, a part of me thinks they couldn't be that idiotic to run those type of schemes or that type of play, knowing how visible they are. Andrew Tate's always saying he's the most Googled man in the world. If that's true, you surely have to be a bit smarter than that to kind of be the person also, you know, arranging a transport of people coming from countries where they're entering in illegally, all this sort of stuff. It just doesn't make any sense, really. That's the only part of it that I'm a little bit dubious about. But I guess with the charges now being placed, it's now becoming a little bit clearer as to what the Romanian government think they're guilty of. And now I guess it's a case of just taking to trial and seeing what I've won. But if the Romanian government been able to treat them the way they've been treating them so far, they don't really have much chance, do they, really, in the flipping courts, you'd think, um, the Tates. Um, maybe they could have, maybe there's a possibility that they can, you know, expose the truth in the courts because they can get to present their own evidence. But considering how hard they're going at them, it's not really, it doesn't feel like they're trying to scare them away from Romania. It feels like they're trying to lock them up to send a clear message to their populace. So let's see what happens. But the article says as follows. 
um, controversial influencer Andrew Tate has been charged in Romania with rape, human trafficking, and forming an organized crime group um, to sexually exploit women. Um, his brother, I wonder why that's different from human trafficking. Oh, I guess because they're sexually exploiting, isn't it, really? Anyway, well, let me continue. His brother Tristan and two associates also face charges and have all denied the allegations. The Tate brothers were first arrested in at their Bucharest home in December. In March, they were moved to custody in house arrest following a ruling by the Romanian judge. The indictment deposited um, uh, with the with the Bucharest court says that the four defendants formed an organized crime group in 2021 to commit human trafficking in Romania, but also in other countries, including the US and UK. God damn, world tour. It names seven of those victims who say that they were recruited by the Tate brothers through false promises of love and marriage. So there's seven alleged victims. I know Tristan's arguing that they don't exist and that these are psyops, but let's see what happens when it goes to court the alleged victims were later taken to buildings in a place called Ilfov County in Romania where they were intimidated placed under the constant surveillance and control and forced into debt according to a statement from Romanian prosecutors the defendants allegedly then forced the women to take part in pornography which was later shared on social media one defendant is accused of raping a woman twice in March 2022 the statement or, or adds the trial will not start immediately and is expected to take several years. A Romanian judge now has 60 days to inspect the case um, before he can be sent to trial. The media team for the Tate brother says, while wow, this news is undoubtedly predictable, we embrace the opportunity to present or to demonstrate their innocence and vindicate the reputation. It added that the indictment also allows us to present a comprehensive body of evidence diligently collected and prepared over time, which will undoubtedly substantiate the brother's claims of innocence. There's also separate charges still being under investigation, which should could lead to a separate indictment. Um, including money laundering and trafficking of minors so they could get found not guilty of those other charges and then get hit with the other ones straight as they walk out like Boosie did when he got picked up um, after his one case got dismissed and the other one didn't he went on to gain notoriety online for Twitter from banning people from saying women should be bear some responsibility for being sexually assaulted he has since been reinstated despite social media bans hold on what did he do let's just read that again what did he do to get removed he went on to go he went on to get notoriety online. His fight with banning world, so he ended up banging her on the floor. Um, let's see again. Buh, 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 buh. Despite social media bans, he gained popularity, particularly among young men, uh, by promoting what he presents as a hyper masculine, ultra luxurious lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, let's see what happens. Let's see how this kind of plays out. No one really knows the truth for this issue, really, until maybe it goes to court. And even in court, there is no kind of, you know, there is no seeking of the truth, really, in some respects. You know, you've got two opposing counsels trying to prove each other wrong. But I wonder if they're charged now, if that means they're still in house arrest. Or does it change and they've now got to get put in jail or prison because there might be a flight risk? I don't really know, to be fair, but, um, you know, let's see what happens and let's see this plays out. Ah, and this has come really, really bad news a bit of a bummer to be fair um the rapper or mostly the podcaster Techstone, has been sentenced to 35 years for the irving plaza shooting that killed troy av's bodyguard if you're not familiar troy av was essentially the first i would say really popular hip-hop podcaster that came from the streets um he was able to be incredibly insightful around that kind of way of life and also be extremely hilarious um definitely somebody i felt like would be a big huge star if he was still around today based on some of the personalities that exist within that hip-hop podcasting content space i feel like he would have done a lot of good things but unfortunately he let his beef with Troy av online spill out into the streets and it turned into an absolutely crazy event when they were both at this um event at irving plaza i think it might be like a ti party or something and they kind of crossed paths and got into a scuffle which led to a gunfight which led to Troy Ives bodyguard and one of his best friends Banger passing away and then of course Taxstone uh, being found guilty of what he did and kind of be sentenced to 35 years which is absolutely crazy to be fair but it's really the article it says former rapper um, I will say rapper I thought say more a podcaster um, was slapped with a 35 year prison sentence on Tuesday for the infamous 2016 Irving Plaza shooting that left a survival musician's bodyguard dead the Brooklyn rapper whose real name is Daryl Campbell was ordered to serve a sentence in prison followed by a five years post-release supervision so he's going to be spending five years on, on basically on um, probation 
crazy. The friend and bodyguard of his nemesis, rapper Troy Ave, um, a.k.a. Roland Collins. Daryl Campbell used a firearm to target his rival, which led to a loss of life and serious injuries to innocent bystanders. My life district attorney, Alvin Bragg, has had a statement. Um, let's see what Alvin Bragg said in this statement. Uh, gun violence cannot be used as a way to address conflict that continues here to quote a toll of guns continues to be staggeringly high and it's horrific that a night out at a concert ended so tragically campbell continued to claim that he was the innocent victim of the calculated hit at the hands of collins who prosecutors had long-standing feud with, with the podcast following up to the backstage bloodbath in a last ditch effort campbell claimed half of the stuff that we was told on the stand by troy Ab, who was later a shorter sentence for a testimony is complete lie to protect herself than it is absolutely crazy event but like i said a real kind of cautionary tale to never ever take rap beef like that too seriously because look what ends up happening uh troy Av i mean sorry taxone essentially kept it real essentially brought the concourse smoke to troy Av regards of where they're at um, pulled out his piece and ended up kind of essentially inadvertently um shooting and killing a police officer just minding their business that's a really kind of sad, messed up part about the whole shield situation. Um, and like I said, 35 years plus five years probation is absolutely brutal. Um, all things considered, especially when you can think of the amount of time he's been in, you know, jail already or prison already, just relaxing and chilling while listening to flipping Boosie tell some nonsense. But yeah, um, that's all I really had to say on that one. Um, bang your doors, tax them, bang your doors. But again, a cautionary tale for everybody. Um, leave everyone alone, even if they annoy you. Just pay attention to, to something else. It really isn't that big of a deal in my opinion. But hey, what do I know? Oh yeah, you know, I also wanted to talk about it. I thought it was really weird and super interesting to kind of read from afar. Um, but also kind of harrowing for the people involved. Well, not kind of, very harrowing. It's this whole thing going on with this submarine at the moment. This epically named submarine called the titanic that's been missing now for a few days and essentially the people inside it have only as a headline says 40 hours of air left so if they're not found before thursday then most likely everybody inside is going to perish and i think there's like five people inside there right so let me just get like a brief little kind of overview of what's happened for you here the summary coach of bbc says as follows the tourist submar the, the tourist submersible that gone missing with five people on board has less than 30 hours of air left according to authorities estimates contact with a small sub was lost on sunday more than halfway into its dive to the titanic wreck site off the coast of newfoundland in canada British Pakistani businessman um, Shadzada Dawood and his son Suleiman are on board, along with British businessman and explorer Hamish Harding. Paul Henry Naglit, the former French Navy diver who's explored the Titanic before, is also on the vessel, as is Stockton Rush, um, the chief executive of Ocean Gate, the firm behind the dive. Um, international planes and ships have joined the urgent search mission which has been called very complex by the u.s coast guard so these guys are legitimately at you know somewhere down in the depths of the ocean and um, they went there on an exploration trip it's some sort of trip that rich people do where they want to go next to the site of the actual titanic ship and explore it and then come back up again um, which is really 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 bizarre when you look at the actual submarine itself it does it's not that impressive it basically just looks like a tube um with you know barely some places in it that you can kind of see through i'm assuming maybe with some cameras that kind of project it on the inside and that's the one thing that kind of just got me because it clearly looks like something that would cost a little bit of money um as kind of uh basic and a slapdash as this little gizmo looks i'm sure it's quite expensive to get inside this ocean gate titan submarine thing but the one thing that kind of firstly brought out to me was the fact that it doesn't really look like a submarine and then i checked online and stuff and i think the actual definition of a submarine is having something that hasn't it has to have an engine in it it has to be able to kind of you know um go backwards and forwards up and down whereas i think this submergible thing basically can go down and up essentially like a it's it, it's like a cylindrical lift in that respect so it's not technically a submarine from what i've been reading up so far anyway but i'm just thinking overall if i'm a billionaire 
or even if I've got, you know, somewhere in the high millions, surely there's got to be other things in your life that will bring you a little bit more of a buzz, that will get you off, that will make you feel like you've got your money's worth, that something that's a unique experience that you can have only with that kind of money. Because I honestly feel like this experience doesn't seem like it's worth it. Um, the, You know, the juice is definitely not worth the squeeze to be inside this capsule. Not even the fact of the, how dangerous it is, it's more so the experience doesn't look that great from what i can see so far just looking at the actual cylinder itself it doesn't look that interesting of a time to be inside to make all that stuff worth it it kind of reminds me a little bit of the um of the jeff bezos uh powered what you call it um spaceship i think it's called that like blue origin or something where it can only go up into orbit and you have a small time of, of weightlessness where you can kind of run around and stuff and do your thing and come back down again i don't necessarily think that's worth the squeeze because if i'm not able to go you know around orbit or something or or just go a little bit into space for a while and then come back down the ability just to go up and down again and imagine if something malfunctions and you end up perishing just just for the mere sake of being able to be weightless for like a minute or two it doesn't seem that to be the most uh, worthwhile thing but god almighty man prayers go out to everybody that's stuck in that submarine really i'm hoping they're able to kind of find these people um within the next 30 hours or so um the update here so far kershaw bbc says for of the third day of rescue u.s coast guard commanders continue to lead a complex search operation over an area of ocean larger than the state of connecticut flipping hell um, rescue efforts um, from Canada Navy, Air Force and Coast Guard as well as the New York Air National Guard are assisting. A French research vessel has also joined the search. Um, the Titan submersible is thought to be approximately 900 miles east and 400 miles south of Newfoundland, capital St. John's. Um, the contact was lost with the, shop, with the sub um, one hour and 45 minutes into its two hour and a half dive down the Atlantic wreck site. So just before it's about to come up, actually, that's actually even more harrowing. It lost contact within the one hour of 45 minutes or oh, sorry yeah it lost contact with the sub one hour 45 minutes into its two hour dive so it only had 15 minutes only had 15 minutes left to come up and then it lost contact which is really harrowing um and then according to u.s coast guard estimates the titan has roughly 30 hours of oxygen remaining on board the really funny bit and almost tragic bit about this is that i've mentioned this before in a stream one of the sons of these people who were stuck inside a submarine posted that he went to a Blink-182 concert and the caption was like, oh, I know this is tasteless or distasteful, but my family would want me to go to this concert because they know Blink-182 is my favorite band. So as his flipping stepdad is in one of these submarines fighting for his life, um, you know, there's all these Coast Guard, um, you know, there's all these Coast Guard rescue teams from Canada, um, from France, from all over the place assisting um, with the rescue. Everybody's on red alert. He's over there listening to fucking Blink-182 and some random concert and have an absolute great time dancing away, drinking away, smiling away and just having an absolute best time ever, <laughs> which is absolutely harrowing. Like, honestly, some people's kids are just awful. Um, we've got this article here quickly from somebody that says, Ocean Gate fired expert who warned about the titan safety in 2018 now everybody's also coming out of the woodwork with you know with some revisionist history and stuff and armchair quarterback stuff but maybe there's some truth in this the article says a submarine expert who works at the ocean gate um the company that operates the missing sub submersible um warned of the potential safety problems in 2018 according to u.s court documents david lockridge uh, moved to scotland from washington state to work for the firm in a bbc interview that's him there right that guy lockridge in a bbc interview in 2017 he infused about the mission and said it was destined for the sea but less than a year later he warned his bosses that flaws in the titan's carbon hole might go undetected without more stringent testing and he urged the company to have an outside agency certify the vessel he said that his verbal warnings were ignored and until the until he wrote a report that was called into a meeting with several officials including ocean gate executive stockton rush who was aboard the missing submersible ocean gate responded by firing Luckridge. oh my god this guy uh, raised the alarm, let them know there was issues with it. And instead of actually heeding his warning, they fired him. 
The company sued him for revealing confidential information and the submarine expert countersued for unfair dismissal. The lawsuit was later settled. Through his lawyer, Lockridge declined to comment today. Court documents also state that Lockridge learned that the manufacturers of the Titan forward viewpoint only certified it to a depth of 1,300 metres. The Titanic wreck lies at 3,800 metres below the surface. Jesus. So it's not even permissible to go that deep deep anyway into the ocean oh my god that is crazy and obviously a picture about who's on board you've got Suleiman and you've got the how do you say pronounce his name i think it's shahadzaz shah shahzadza 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 badawood if you're catching up with the story here's a quick summary hamish harding is 58 a british adventurer who's previously been to space multiple times and to the south pole uh british imagine he's been to space and he's been to the south pole but the most harrowing experience so far has been him trying to traverse the bottom of the ocean. That's one place I think I'm kind of agreeing with, with a lot of people who are kind of space skeptics and stuff and would much rather we kind of focus on stuff that happens on our planet instead of kind of exploring space. I wouldn't go that far because I still think space exploration is super important, but I think there should be a lot more onus, a lot more emphasis put on exploring the depths of the ocean and finding out what lies beneath because for some reason we don't. We want to go search all these other places, but we don't want to go and search the depths of the ocean, find new species and just see what lies beneath anyway in general um maybe we could find a lost civilization that day you never know uh british businessman shadzab dawood a member of one of five pakistani's richest families and a supporter of two charities founded by king charles god almighty why is somebody that rich and that important going down in a submarine it looks so janky like that oh my god um his son suleiman dawood Dadu, uh, Dawood, sorry, a 19 year old student is also there, as is Paul Henry, Nagal at 77. So they were quite old, didn't it, these people? With a 19 year old, um, 48, 58, 61. Jesus Christ. Um, Henry, sorry, Paul Henry Naglet, a French Navy diver who's um, reportedly spent more time in a Titanic wreck than any other explorer. So they've got the people they need on board to survive. If there was a hiring moment where they need to kind of, you know, make the most of the oxygen available, they've got the right people on board to kind of give people, keep everyone calm. But can they be found on time? That's the issue. Stockton Rush 61, the chief executive of Ocean Gate, the firm that operates the Titan, is also on board. So at least the person who fired that guy who raised the alarm was also on board. He's actually going down with the ship. So there's some, you know. There's some, um, I want to say justice or beauty, there's some honour in that. He's not sat somewhere in some conference room or I and I be for having a good time. And then last one here, we've got US Senator Mark Keeley or Mark Kelly, um, a former NASA astronaut and US Navy captain, has said that he feels for the families whose loved ones are aboard. It's interesting that there's a lot of people that who've worked in space and also are part of the, um, uh, part of the Navy. I wonder what the correlation is between both. There's a lot of people that are astronauts and also work Navy, isn't it? I see a lot of this here. Um, Ikatu said, it's a risky environment. You're operating, and he told CBS, drawing on his experience of outer space, he said, a submarine like that has similar system to a spacecraft. Okay, there we go. You've got to scrub out CO2. You've got to provide a breathable atmosphere. We've got the opposite pressure problem in space. So this is going to be challenging rescue operation with unknown outcomes. I encourage everybody that can work positively to bring these five individuals home on this in a collaborative way. Jesus Christos, mate. Absolutely wild. So, again, force and fears everybody out there. But like I said, I just think if I was a millionaire, if I was a billionaire, there'd be better things I'd be doing with my money than sitting my ass in this horrible flipping submarine and dive into the depths of the ocean to go check out the flipping wreckage of the Titanic, which you can't even go out and go and see and explore. You're just going to be checking it out through a little shitty fucking, you know, GoPro somewhere, or whatever. It's just not, doesn't seem like it's worth it to me. But again, you know, what do I know when it comes to this stuff? What do I I bloody no. Moving on from this, we got this article courtesy of Resident Advisor that I thought was really interesting to check out regarding the very risky DJ budgets. It says how rising DJ fees are reshaping the dance music economy. Now, I wasn't too aware of how rising DJ fees are disproportionately affecting the markets outside of the big global ones, like places in Europe and the Western world in general, um, because I just didn't think DJs would do stuff that's been kind of suggested in this article. So this article suggests that there are some DJs or some agencies that are essentially trying to get their clients the same fees that they would get playing in places like London and playing in places like New Delhi. 
right, in places like Bogota, where clearly there's, you know, the economy isn't as good as it is here, they haven't got as much disposable income, or just generally they can't afford to pay the fees that DJs get paid in London over there. But clearly they have a lot of, you know, they have a really big fan base, or they have, um, you know, a, a scene that's willing to welcome them and show them the ropes and stuff and you know they'd be one of only a few foreigners to arrive there so people would be super happy to see them i just assumed if you're a dj coming up or if you're just an established dj the opportunity to kind of spread your wings and play in kind of far-flung places would be great regardless of what they paid you because it's just an opportunity to go to places that you probably would never visit um if you weren't djing and i always kind of viewed it a little bit like fashion photographers there's this understanding out there that fashion photographers essentially get their chance to kind of show off artistically and be creative by doing editorials for magazines which they usually don't get paid for but they get a chance to shoot with different brands they get chances to shoot on interesting locations with different stylists and different creatives just a chance to kind of flex your photography muscles but then where they earn their bread and butter is usually from campaigns working with high street brands working with car companies whatever it may be that's where they actually make their actual bread and butter but they get an opportunity you to kind of work for free um or for you know to cover their fucking costs working for id or vogue and stuff they're going to take it because those things are also things that can improve your portfolio and ironically get you more corporate gigs because they see the stuff that you do so i thought a dj would do the same thing you'd go play for like i don't know half of what you usually play for in a random location uh because it's a receptive crowd and because you want to just explore this weird country that you probably would never visit but then you also get the opportunity to maybe play there once or twice a year maybe even more if you do a good job but then you also get the opportunity to kind of connect with people in that local community add it to your fucking roster of place that you've been to that's kind of a win-win but then own your real nut your real kind of money man that will come from doing all the big festivals and gigs in europe and obviously in parts of north america that would be the obvious thing to do in that regard but djs don't because i guess they just all want the money and I think this also explains to me this article because I think I've said it a few times to a few people and just something I've always kind of thought about, like especially being an up and coming DJ myself. Um, why is it that there's not an industry or there isn't a practice in DJing where the bigger DJs kind of put their arms around some up and coming ones and just bring them around just so they can kind of be a part of their kind of come up, but also to kind of help and assist them if they ever wake up one day and just aren't bothered to play. Because in my head, I'm like, oh, hold on. Imagine you're a really big DJ and you decide to take somebody on the road with you to kind of open through your sets for you. Maybe you say, you know what? I don't really like it when I go to random places and the person playing before me just playing super hard so i'm gonna give my dj who's coming with me an hour to just kind of set the room because they know what kind of vibe i like to kind of come into they come on for an hour and you kind of take over but there might be sometimes also you wake up and you just hung over you don't want to play and you get the chance to your djs to play or maybe you're going to organize with a promoter to give your dj who's you're bringing along with you an opportunity to play more times regardless but the whole adage of thinking behind it was that there'd be an opportunity for the bigger person to kind of put their arm around the smaller person and kind of co-sign them via proxy of standing next to them but then of course the reality of it is most djs are greedy or selfish or just don't like sharing because it's kind of an individual sport um very rarely are you going to get them kind of offering you help or suggestions on how to get gigs and stuff it's more so you know you kind of do your own thing they kind of act like you don't exist and then once you arrive at that place that they're at suddenly now everybody's friends you see that a lot with a lot of djs all the bigger all the ones that are big and make smashing it and getting 100 to 200 gigs per year they're all pally 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 but most likely when they're all coming up there was little to no communication between them because they were all fighting for the same spots and you know maybe there's a limited amount of spots maybe i don't think so really i think mostly has to do with the fact that a lot of djs don't quit or move on it's probably one of the only careers in the arts or entertainment i can think of you can do until you're very very old um and usually for the most part depending on what scene you're in but especially if you're in the european scene the older you are the better it is for you you see what's happening with ricardo Villalobos and luciano they're still evergreen they still get booked everywhere across europe because they've got a rabid fan base and people in europe just seem to kind of you know um um take a lot of credence or credit or take a lot of value in somebody who is an og and pioneered the scene and being able to see them again is great 
like they don't care if you're 50 or 21 they're still going to come and rock with you so i think that kind of creates a little bit of a bottleneck where there's not much space for people to come into but even when they do come in they want to do their own thing they don't, the last thing they want to do is be like oh preaching their hand back because they spent the majority of their time fighting for the position that they have so they have no room or no time to kind of reach their hand back and try and help somebody else which is again understandable but i think all of those things add to the overall issue and the other thing that i also mentioned i went to mention reading this article that was really illuminating was that it made me kind of understand why my idea my naive utopian idea i thought that that the dj world would change completely because of the pandemic and because of brexit was really naive my idea was or my thinking was that because of the pandemic because of brexit um and just because of people's changing habits that most likely promoters would have to try and rely on local up-and-coming people to book and to play so you'd end up with a scene where promoters and event bookers and venues are forced to book more local people like myself in an effort to keep clubs running and to kind of make sure people are still coming but then also by by default kind of educating and kind of growing um and nurturing talent you know to play for a rabid fan base of people that come to a nightclub every single weekend that would be the great way to do it so it kind of be done because they've been forced into it or because they want to but still it'll be a net positive for everybody because you'll get a chance to cultivate a whole group and generation of up-and-coming djs and you also get the opportunity to keep you know the scene going regardless of all the big ones going away but what actually happened was that the appetite for people to go out increased way more than it was before because we were all locked away for two and a half years, maybe three. And then because of the, you know, because of the cost of rising, cost of the rising cost of living, the energy cost, clubs now are trying to make sure that they're booking the biggest people to come in so that they can guarantee ticket sales and guarantee sellouts because they can't take a risk on someone like myself playing there because they don't they can't take a risk that one person will come or 500 people will come they want to take a guarantee that 300 people would come if they book this so and so big DJs to play so they'd rather overspend and book somebody that's going to guarantee ticket sales to a certain degree then try to underspend and then risk you know maybe not making any money or even breaking even or even losing money in a night so that's the kind of things that's actually happening in reality which is a little bit unfortunate which is why at the moment still i would say the one scene in the uk specifically that's doing a really good job of kind of championing and pushing new djs and new artists has to be places like fold of course what they're doing with unfold on sundays is really good in terms of just you know promoting family and friends and people that are kind of coming up in that regard and then that kind of come that can then push on to the other night that they do where they promote people that are on their flipping in-house label or in-house resident dj roster but the other thing also i think that people are doing really well is what i describe as like the alternative scene which is kind of encompasses the lgbtq gay and queer scene all those guys and girls are doing an incredible job of promoting and pushing their own people yes they do book some big people here and there but for the most part you know nights like he she day when it was here budokai inferno um what is another one uh club verb boat and there's a few others of these kind of you know alternative kink lgbtq queer gay nights that essentially focus in on only promoting people within their community of course i'm assuming most of it has to do with just a vibe and you know comfort and just kind of getting you know knowing what people are about and stuff and whatever it may be there's other things that kind of go into the decision making of doing that but i think because they do it they get an opportunity to actually cultivate a whole group of djs who are able to you know hold up and entertain big events where people are coming in from all over the world all over the flipping country to come and see and they're not bored they're not turned off because they ain't seen this big glitzy dj like you know i don't know eats everything or like a blessed madonna playing they're happy to see kind of local heroes playing and if anything they're probably championing them more because they know these people they see the grind they see the effort and it's something that they kind of want to get behind so i really really do love and appreciate stuff like that that they're doing um but like i said it's really harrowing really sad to kind of see the reality of what the industry is like and the fact that you know because of these rising dj fees it's negatively affecting these really smaller markets who haven't got an ability to compete as much with people on the higher up so if i scroll down quickly i'll see some of it um 
it kind of gives me an issue here. I can kind of read out something that kind of gives you an idea of what people are speaking about. I think we can maybe even start about here. <clears throat> uh, this person says, um, in terms of the current economic situation, the biggest aspect for my clients is travel. It's just so expensive right now, sometimes four or five times more than it's been historically. This makes it difficult for clients to go outside of the scenes they're based in as we generally want to avoid big fee increases. So quite often we just have to say no to international shows, which again, is is, is horrible because part of the beauty of dance music is the ability to see all these different people from all walks of life from all around the world um, bringing their sound um, to different places and having this weird kind of like mashing of sounds and scenes and inspiration and then sometimes them just playing in those places and going back and taking those learnings could affect and influence the songs or the stuff that they make creatively which would then kind of add another kind of patina and another kind of color and hue to what they're obviously doing going forward um, another one says here ra spoke to an internationally dj who requested to be anonymous about her recent experiences they said we recently did a tour in australia and the flights were so expensive like double what they were before because of that we had to take on some of the shows that we wouldn't normally do to get ourselves there sometimes the better shows just pay less yep and that's what i was saying before like uh the adage or the the analogy i use of fashion photographers about they basically do the free work for magazines um and to, but to be more creative it probably gives them more life it makes them feel them more inspired but then those jobs actually then lead you to get the corporate jobs that actually pay your bills it continues here it says already the geographic disadvantages the reduced um financial muscles of bookers is a peripheral in peripheral market sorry and threatens our worldwide growth of economic music which has include introduced a laudable degree of diversity into an overwhelmingly white industry so diversity is there but then the rising cost is actually affecting the ability to you know keep that up because now you know essentially you want to get more bang for your buck you want to ensure that the people that you're booking are able to sell tickets so then you have to kind of go back to a try and true method so this is why i sometimes have sympathy for a lot of these people who were doing the whole like you know minimal very white booking policy because even back then the difficulties that existed with trying to cultivate an entirely different scene and trying to maybe bring in new voices and new sounds it was the same sort of challenges i know brexit and stuff didn't exist but the same challenges were still there as you know the fan base gonna get it is it gonna be worth the money is it gonna be worth the time um imagine if you book somebody unknown and they come play an event here in london and then no one turns up it might actually negatively affect their confidence and their ability to get back up and dj so all these things kind of play into it they continue to said we also tried to put together a south american tour and it just wasn't working the anonymous artist said the fees that i was getting offered were just not enough to cover the cost of everything it was basically a break-even situation and again i don't blame them because if you're a dj and you are getting paid ten thousand plus to play at some random festival in europe why would you then do what i would do which was take the kind of you know the head the kind of heads and about the community and about the scene approach and basically you know do yourself a disservice by getting less money playing in a venue on in a place that you've never played in before on the market you never played at um just because you want to help the scene and community when really no one's doing that <laughs> not even the people in the local community are doing that and you're kind of you know basically for going yourself for the greater good personally i would do it because i feel like the benefit the you know long term is there but i understand why some people who have bills and children and shit and mortgages to pay are like you know what i'm gonna take the fucking 10 grand from playing at mail or something it continues says in a bit to navigate this reality while keeping their events accessible the organizations solvent and their bookings exciting some promoters just had to adapt their tactics for example by reframing offers to include unique localized benefits i love this approach it says all this had to be made me reflect more on the value of montreal offers um, touring artists and had led me to better formulate this story when engaging with ev with agents said matthew it's a win-win for artists to become known in a new market and we offer it to invest in a long-term relationship to help them scale over time which is absolutely phenomenal right to have the ability to kind of bring somebody in that way and basically promise them a look if you work with us if you trust us if you accept this reduced fee we're going to do our best to do all these other things outside of this essentially like an a a and r and kind of grow with you as an artist introduce you to different you know people promoters radio stations whatever maybe communities and little by little kind of grow you to the point where you become a really great touring artist that comes here four times a year or something sells out 500 cap venue places 
pieces and absolutely kills it um that would be legitimately awesome and then who knows maybe the person ends up doing it so often and end up falling over the city and moving there that's also a great way to end the story it continues here it says while well, some promoters have responded to economic fluctuations with safe conservative programming others have redoubled their efforts on growing their local underground culture um kwasam moktera co-founder and head booker here at hanois club in savage stresses the importance of cultivating local international relationship over time they said for us the best experience is to invest in strong residents which i agree with up and coming internationals while budding uh, building trust with agents he said if you constantly offer high quality events people will trust you and they they trust you they'll always follow you this has always been my adage if i when i get open my club not if when i open my own nightclub this is what i'm going to focus on obviously i'm going to book myself all the time but for the most part it'll be on building a strong core of resident djs and then having the ability to bring in some up and coming rising international acts to kind of pepper um, on top of it or to kind of add the cherry on top. That's what I would do. And of course, the random nights you can have Ellen and Ellen come in and playing, but you wouldn't rely on having those big names to keep your club afloat. You'd want to make sure or oh, I'd want to make sure Thursday to Sunday, the resident DJ is able to hold it down every single weekend because that's essentially what you get when you go to the clubs like Berkheim or even other clubs like Berlin in Berlin. Essentially, they are propped up um by the in-house resident dj teams who are able to just do what they do all the time i think of places like club division is a good place where for the most part yes there are promoters but they've got a whole roster of people that just play there on a regular basis probably like tuesday to fucking sunday and you just keep that place rocking and then if they want to for the odd times here and there get a ricardo villalobos to come and play get a fucking you know a bush a rush a john rushkin or whatever his fucking name is they'll just have a deep house guys to come in it can kind of help to kind of pepper over everything um and it continues here it says on a, on the value of local artists and kali nasimi agreed they said for years i've felt there's a huge imbalance in the scene when it comes to fees it's very often happens that circled headliners or more precisely international guests don't bring in that many extra people to the club exactly what does bring in people to club in the country are local artists and crews i definitely agree that local hero especially that person who's kind of got it from the mud who has a story to tell who everybody's seen their grind will probably have a better ability to fill up a club in the middle of fucking singapore than some random international person that not many people in that scene know because they don't have access to their stuff or they just aren't caring as much because that's something i also like i love those international scenes that you go to where they don't necessarily care about the djs that you care about they care about the ones that from play every week at their place which which is why i was kind of heartbroken when i went to nicaragua and i heard them playing like really commercial american edm and there wasn't really a local don't get me wrong maybe it was the area i was in that said that was that was the issue because i went to a really obvious touristy city like leon but it was really upsetting to hear them just playing the obvious you know um edm english records no reggaeton no nothing local to where they're from no local artists everything was kind of the same stuff you'd hear at any commercial kind of club in parts of europe or north america stuff but yeah regardless the article was really interesting i really recommend you check it out if you're interested in the economics of flipping dj um, bookings and the scene in general and how we are in the position that we're in now if you're in certain locations you think to yourself oh my god why is it the same people playing again and again and again this is part of the reason why it is like this so hopefully this um articles like this and these kind of conversations will allow people to kind of look a bit internally and kind of figure out ways to fix things so that we have a better thriving community of places and not not just the same old thing that's happening now where there are certain places where it's absolutely sick to go out and everyone kind of flocks there and it kind of gets bait but then there's not enough exploration i even had to say it for myself like outside of going to georgia and going to kiev when the war ends there's not really big places that people are going to everyone's kind of going to the same three places berlin amsterdam kiev um georgia right in terms of places to go to and hang, hang out um but no one's really exploring the other parts of the country or even the world um that have thriving scenes that are really doing bits because for the most part the highlight is only in those kind of big places because that's where kind of everyone goes to play so maybe a change will kind of help everybody to kind of broaden their horizons myself included myself included 
And then we've got this article as well, courtesy of RA, that I thought was absolutely heinous, but also kind of speaks to the overall attitude that exists within the British government and British society once it comes to young people having fun. I've long held the suspicion that overall, as UK people, as British people, wherever it may be, people that came before us have just always hated, have always had a very competitive relationship with the youth and just generally don't like to see people that are young, free and whatever, have fun. I don't know what it is. I'm not too sure if it's because we have you know catholic origins or something i'm not too sure what the issue is but there's definitely an issue ingrained with us as a society where we deplore people having fun which is why we have these draconian licensing laws draconian drinking laws drug um you know attitudes are very 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 much caught in the flipping old ages which kind of leads to this weird underbelly of sordidness where we have some of the highest you know usages of stuff like cocaine and shit but for the most part we don't really have a healthy attitude around talking about it um talking about you know alcoholism and shit all these kind of things aren't really spoken about in open so we have this really interesting weird um dark underbelly of people doing stuff behind closed doors and in secret but most of the time if you do stuff like that in secret for long enough it will usually come to light and by the time it does it can have devastating effects so all this to say this headline courtesy of heart resonant virus broke my heart it said blood on your hands blood on sula braveman's hands uk dance music industry slams the government's u-turn on festival drug testing so there's meant to be physical drug testing introduced this season actually i didn't even know this um to obviously combat some of the horrible headlines we saw last year and a few years before that of people young people especially going to festivals and unfortunately passing away due to flipping dodgy pills that they were flipping ingesting over there and the really tragic part about it was that most of the time it was with really you know inexperienced drug users super young who basically would go to places like the festivals and do everything wrong in terms of not eating in terms are not hydrating and in an effort to kind of show off and be cool or just to kind of feel like they're part of their group they would go overboard with the drugs which would then lead to some really really tragic circumstances where people would be passing away and whatnot and there was even stories of people passing away and being left alone for hours on end while their friends enjoyed themselves or why other friends maybe knew what was going on but didn't know how to handle it and you can just imagine how lonely of experience that must have been those last few moments so maybe the addition of drug testing especially free and anonymous testing would allow people to feel a little bit more comfortable uh, but what they're taking and know what's inside of things and also maybe the threat or just just the presence sorry of having the drug testing places there it would dissuade some scummy drug dealers from not selling horrible mashup shit to kids over there anyway because most likely what it takes is one test for your entire business to be ruined so um, obviously UK government said no we're not going to do that we don't want actually to save kids lives we just want to continue this you know trend of kids going to festivals and dying because they're taking dodgy drugs because what I think it does it serves their bottom line which is they want a complete eradication of those things anyway they'd much rather have a country full of cocktail bars and restaurants than clubs and festivals they hate it even though they contribute a lot to the bottom line and whatnot they don't want it so the article says as follows the home office in the UK has re retracted its support of the drug testing at festivals right on the cusp of the summer season crazy the u-turn came just days before manchester's park life last weekend where drug testing charity the loop was blocked from carrying out plant testing on confiscated substances organizations like the loop must now apply for licenses to continue this work at festivals which is a three-month wait some cor corners of the uk dance music industry have slammed the government uh bristol nightlife advisor carly heath said as follows it's deeply uh, sorry it's a deadly step backwards uh, because the three month license application process makes it impossible to meet the requirements, the time to carry out potentially life saving work. Michael Kill, the NTIA um, head, says the U term is a considerable ramification, so the potential to put people's lives at risk. But according to a spokesperson for the Home Office, it's long established that legal requirement from the Misuse of Drugs Regulations Act 21 2001 that licenses are needed to lawfully undertake activities, including uh, possession, supply, or production of controlled drugs. We have been clear that these were the parties that involved drug testing services are undertaking services with control drugs. They need to apply for a home office license. Uh, absolutely heinous, man. Drug testing has helped raise the alarm about dangerous substances and circulations with alerts often sent as push notifications via festival apps. Um, at Park Life, the loop identified MDMA pills one and a half times the normal strength. At Boomtown Festival, Boomtown, sorry, Boomtown Fair, um, drug testing organization Tic Tac found, Clo what's that? chloroquine jesus christ which is used to prevent malaria and can cause diarrhea vomiting and skin rashes being sold as ketamine oh my days 
yo, you are a scumbag drug dealer if you're doing that. You're selling chloroquine as fucking ketamine. Yo, I guess they probably dry it up and it can look like crystals and shit. That is crazy. Um, last year, Bristol was set to become the first day city in the UK to provide regular pop-up drug check-in where residents could get substances checked for toxic materials, but these plans are currently on hold until licenses and agreements are put in place. Crazy, man, that they're doing this, man. Honestly, this could be so helpful for so many people, but they would rather just people dying and shit. In the meantime, some event organizers are incensed at the U-turn and its impact on the current festival season. It says to land such a decision two days before the UK's biggest metropolitan and festival which just took 12 months of planning and the government is in an, it's an integral part of is appalling says Sasha Lord Manchester United Time Economy Advisor and Park Life Co-Founder yeah big up Sasha Lord he's like the better version of Amy Lammy out there in Manchester um, I wouldn't see when, Amy, when is Amy Lammy going to get fired why isn't she talking about this issue why isn't she front and centre trying to combat this also that woman is fucking useless she's got a job for life and she doesn't do anything absolutely heinous bro her, honestly Get this woman out of fucking office. Hopefully it means, uh, I think Amy Lammy has to only leave if uh, if fucking Sadiq Khan leaves, I think, innit? But I don't know why she's never got fired. She's been useless as a nighttime, you know, as a night czar and advocating for clubs and nightlife and dance music and festivals and shit. She's been absolutely useless. Uh, but big up Sasha Lord, he's been anything but useless. It says here, Lord said the government is playing politics with kids' lives by creating a moral panic about drugs, which will feed into the possible sorry which will feed into the politically charged prohibited prohibition fueled campaign to win public votes should prime minister rishi sunak succumb to the pressures of calling snap election we've got a full summer where millions of kids will go through these gates said lord and if there's no testing facilities and something happens there'll be blood on the home secretary sula braveman's hands that's the way i see it if you can't stop class a drugs getting into high security prisons like fucking strange ways what chances do you have of operators have of stopping them getting into the field they can't stop it so the best thing to do is to try and prevent harm which i definitely agree with a brave man who wants to make cannabis a class a drug <laughs> Yo, these people in our government, you want to make cannabis a class A drug, also rejected calls by harm reduction companies to make spiking a separate criminal offence. So you want to make cannabis a class A drug, but spiking isn't a separate criminal offence. Oh my God, the logic is so insane. Campaigns like Stamp Out Spiking, D Dawn Dies, are concerned that the absence of booth uh, of both drug testing and spiking um, legislation could create a major obstacle for harm reductions. The quote, if change is not made urgently, we will continue to see spiking in all its forms. Research published last year and led by the Professor Fiona Mesham, founder of The Loop and the chairwoman of crime criminology at University of Liverpool, found that drug checking festivals is linked to harm reduction. Duh. The research also carried out between 2016 and 2018 at seven festivals before the ban um, was placed on front of housing testing. RA asked Home Office for guidance on harm reduction festivals and absence, and if license applications are fast tracked, we've yet to receive a response crazy man crazy crazy and again i've said this before because i think the story goes allegedly one story that kind of led me to believe that the uk is bad vibes in general this is where it comes from the uk being bad vibes it's not something that is only specific to a certain demographic or racial group of people it applies across the board was that there's a story that the somebody within the labor party yeah no during the time when there was the acid house movement or revival here in the uk where loads of field raves were happening and shit and random warehouse parties they used to throw mostly field you know field raves and according to the legend it goes that one particular festival that attracted like five thousand people was popping off at some random field but unluckily for the organizers the field belonged to somebody who was a constituent of the you know the government that was in power at that time and they had got in touch with somebody and basically said these kids are ruining my field which then led to a outright ban on public gatherings of that kind of ilk and it kind of led to them kind of stamping it all out all because they incorrectly threw a rave at the wrong field which was linked to somebody that was involved in somebody in the government that's the legend that i've currently heard it comes from that one little incident so imagine if one person has the power to essentially you know essentially destroy an entire subculture an entire scene because they weren't happy that these kids were basically keeping them up at night or something just imagine what a bunch of these people could do if they all conspired together 
it's absolutely crazy, scary, and really shocking that this is happening, especially when you consider the amount of kids that are passing away at these festivals because of a lack of education or insight into what they're actually taking. And there's clear things that can maybe help with drug testing, and they're like, no, we're not going to do that. Let's add some more time to the testing. Let's add some more time to the licensing and make it a real bother for people to kind of, you know, get right with it. It's absolutely disgusting, to be fair. But again, no surprise, living in the UK is the epitome of living in a place that has bad vibes moving on last topic about dance music here another article courtesy of ra big up ra for supplying all of the topics <laughs> regarding the legacy of zinger show it says here anonymity is a lost art anonymity is a lost art it says why some artists are taking breaks from social media and it features um king brit halogenics Susie analog and others um personally i think articles like this are a little bit um are a little bit pointless and also don't serve any purpose because i feel like it's a lot of people in the scene who are coming up and do their things are just people who generally don't really vibe well with social media i think for the most part social media is a necessary evil it's one of those things that most people need especially when you're coming up in order to kind of promote and push yourself you can decide if you want to to not take part in it um i was listening to an interview with dj sprinkles on playful magazine and they essentially said they've never bothered with social media never had a phone but again this is dj sprinkles fairly older establishing a scene great track record of productions a little bit you know eccentric it kind of mashes their personality and how they kind of you know outlook on life so it kind of makes sense it's congruent to who they are but in general they never really spoke took part in the whole social media thing and people have just kind of learned to you know not to expect them to do so and they just kind of continue but i feel like nowadays if you are trying to take part in culture now you kind of do need to play that game and just play it to your benefit but i feel like the people that complain in these sort of articles are the ones who just generally would never be comfortable being on social media like that even if they weren't an artist do you know what i mean but i think their feelings get heightened somewhat being an artist because you have to be very vulnerable you have to be very open it maybe can elicit some interesting feelings inside of you i know it does for me sometimes because i'm very kind of somewhat private and proud for about the stuff that i do i kind of just want people to kind of find it out through word of mouth as opposed to me pushing and promoting myself all the time but i'm also very aware akin to that clip i talk about all the time that tyler the creator did where essentially it's really really important to speak about the stuff that you do and to kind of make sure everybody knows um what you do and how you do it and push it because no one else is going to be a bigger fan of what you do than actually you no one else is going to champion the things that you do than the stuff that you do but for some reason in the arts especially myself i know this to be true um it's something that we don't like to do we don't want to push ourselves and promote that side of ourselves too much to people we just want to keep that stuff private and not kind of mention it to anybody which again like i said is a really strange thing that we all kind of do in this scene for the most part which i think is highly destructive let me see if i can actually find this clip of tyler creator saying you should always push yourself let's see if i can get it on here it's something it's, it's going to be titled like this isn't it maybe it's on here somewhere that i uploaded it because i remember sharing it on twitter a while back of Tyler the Creator basically speaking about the importance of making sure that you know how to push yourself in these sort of remarks. Let's see if I can find it here. Which video is it? So it's not that one. It's not that one. It's not that one. It's not, which one is it? Hmm. Bear with me one second. Let's see. Can I find it? Mm, nope. 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 Have I not got it? Anyway, I can't. Yeah. Well, anyway, I can't find it for now, but if I do, I'm going to actually place it somewhere within this clip here so you can kind of hear it. It's going to be somewhere around here. Oh, a lot of people who make things who don't stand proudly by their stuff, whether they don't want to. It's it's something I'm noticing a lot with the like the generation of right under me is like, I don't know if they too cool or they don't want to look thirsty or they're not proud of their but like they'll put a song out they'll put it in their story and that's it hmm. that's it you went through something you wrote words down you figured it out in the structural format found music to go along with it you recorded it Recorded, you know, you know, most of the time you don't just do it in one take. You go back and forth, da 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 da, fix some parts, get some parts replayed. That's the one you play it for people. Yeah, do this. You edit it. 
you mix it. They're signed to a label. They're still young, so the label has to do all these things. Da, da, da. Sample clearances, pay the mixer, this and that. Da, 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 da. They go pay some kid to do an album cover. They do the album cover. It's a whole thing. And you mean to tell me that you're going to be passive with your own and just put it on your story once? Are you fucking crazy, bro? I'm still promoting my album that came out in June. It's a year out, and I'm still out here. Like, call me if you get lost. Like, uh. <laughs> right? And what I notice is that some of these, the, the younger guys and girls, they like, oh, yeah, I got a song out, and they forget about it. And I'm like, no, let mother because no hmm. tell people when i first put the perfume out dude i had bags of the sample just walking up to people like hi i'm um, tyler da, 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 i made this da, 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 da. because i put time and love and too much energy into this finished project just to put it on instagram and forget about it like no promote your let people know be proud of that you um, made if i do find it anyway continuing on let's go back to the article itself and read what they have to say here courtesy of ra um it says the following for many artists social media has become essential work too but what happens when it gets too much according to a study published by pirate studios on may the 1st 54 percent of the 1000 artists surveyed said that they use social media as a primary way to self-promote so that's over half 51 percent say they've taken breaks from the app at some point in their careers um, last year in the u.s 73 million people across the free period use social media Media, video apps like TikTok, Instagram Reels, and YouTube Shorts to consume music, must watch reports, uh, music watch, sorry, reports. Okay, I didn't know if Instagram Reels are doing that, that many bits. To be fair, the Instagram Reel thing is a little bit inflated because I think nowadays any bit of video content you upload on Instagram, um, it's really hard to get video content to be posted on your main feed as a square. It always gets uploaded to Instagram Reels. I'm not too sure if it's, a, I think it must be a time limit thing because I think before, if you had a post that was under one minute, maybe it was under 58 seconds, it would have uploaded as a feed video. But now if you upload a video over a certain amount, maybe a minute and 20, it will inst instantly upload it as an Instagram reel. So those numbers are kind of inflated. It's a really cheeky thing that startups do to make it seem like there's more engagement and more usage with a particular part of their app and stuff to kind of drive the ability to maybe add, ask for more ad dollars, more sponsorship, raise more money for investment. It's a very cheeky thing to do because essentially also you're also doing a thing where imagine where if they do a thing where every time you open instagram it it automatically pushes a reel at the top of the page so that also means the open rates for instagram reels is really high because when everybody closes and opens the app the first thing you get eight times out of ten is instagram reel and not someone's picture so there's all these little cheeky things people do in startup world to kind of inflate the numbers and make it seem like they are bigger than what they are like if there's ever an industry that's you know basically um plop, plopped up or you know on fucking stilts with fucking fake it till you make it energy it's definitely startup um maybe more so even than dj culture to be fair anyway let's continue here um it says this level of engagement can cause artists to think twice about taking breaks from social media will their following and engagement go down could a break stunt their future promotion rollouts speaking to resident advisor uk artist higo said that he was worried about how the break might negatively affect his career at the time of the interview he was trying to stay away from instagram he says i did end up posting something this afternoon a quick real it's got no engagement at all he said it kind of makes me even more afraid to properly get back into promoting that's one thing i think people shouldn't do i think you should always approach your promotion as the same way that you create your art it's weird to say that because some people just don't think of advertising or promotion as an art but it obviously is because some of it works some of it doesn't um some of it's done well some of it isn't done well so it definitely is an art in it and i think with an art you never go into it with a big expectation you just go into it with wanting to get across a particular idea a particular particular message and then leaving it you know leaving it be and once it goes out into the universe and people have a chance to kind of grab it touch it and do what they want with it they can kind of do what they want with it in that regard you don't really have any control of it in that way there's no real expectation with anything there's no entitlement um that's the way people should kind of approach things but in the world we live in now people are obsessively checking the likes checking the views checking the likes and engagement and shit and all that stuff is really not conducive to a great artistic practice in any way shape or form that's just my opinion it continues um higu dislike 
likes that Instagram feels like a constant social compassion. No, it feels like a constant social comparison. But he also notes that if you're putting out stuff there and constantly and it's getting really good engagement, then it does feel good. It's nice to have that validation. Yeah, you shouldn't really need validation of a social media app to kind of feel like you should continue your work. It should be something that is a calling to you, something that you just feel like you can't do, something that you feel like if you don't do, you can't breathe. That should be what it is. And if you do by default or by proxy, get some engagement along the way then cool that's a great benefit but it should never be oh i'm just doing this for the validation of my peers and my community because you know art in itself should live uh, beyond those kind of you know silly constraints that essentially can hamper the creative expression itself in my opinion but again what do i know it's that studies have shown that the successful social media interactions um release that same feel-good chemical dopamine as food and sex is deliberately addictive nature is linked to harmful effects of mental health um sometimes resulting in depression anxiety in September 2021, the University of Maine claimed that roughly 60% of the global population uses social media, which suggests that most people are susceptible to mental health issues. So the idea that, um, or the people think that people say, especially in Red Scare, they say everyone's mentally ill was actually true. In some regards, where you will suffer from a sense of mental illness, which is why you see people on Instagram uploading Instagram videos of themselves crying. There's a one guy I just saw recently who was snot, like bogey coming out of his nose, weeping into a camera because one of his, you know, live streaming gaming buddies decided he's going to quit i forgot his name some guys quit recently and this guy's friend got on his social media site crying like the guy died but again this is a sign of mental illness that we're all suffering from as a global community unfortunately i don't because i'm well adjusted but there's some people that they do <laughs> it continues so much of the music and performance content is posted online these days by peers um he told ra it's super easy to feel inadequate feel like you should be working harder or trying to alter your image to fit in with the later algorithm breaking content style for likes for a self-described laid-back introvert, the pressure to publicly um, proving his accomplishments is anxiety-inducing. Yeah, but you don't need to do that. You don't need to play that game. Or if you want to play that game, just do what other people do or what I do. Create like a separate artist profile that you don't have any of your friends and family on and just use it as a flipping content pool, a content uh, you know um, platform like you would a blog and just keep pushing out content on there on a daily basis, but separate it from your actual regular account that you use day in, day out people don't want to do that because most likely your regular day and day account has more followers on it so you feel like if you put out content on an account with 20 followers like i have no one's going to see it but that's actually a good place to start and to actually put content out with no expectation um and no judgment obviously because no one there's your friend everyone there's like a professional acquaintance that you want to get to know but you're also trying to push yourself but again what do i know it continues as a result Jay Sparrow's taking many hiatuses from social media. I always feel like imposed hiatuses and breaks, especially if you announce them, are incredibly, incredibly lame. I think do it if you want to. Um, do it if it's going to, you know, contribute to your crazy practice and stuff. But I think the anxiety of being away from those things is very destructive. So you're better off just managing and finding a way to kind of make it work being on there as opposed to taking breaks. But again, you know, uh, he said here, um, he initially feared for getting being forgotten <laughs> and the total opposite has happened. I saw the music and had more streams than ever before because i was creating higher quality original music exactly that's what you should be doing um instead but people don't do that they just spend more time worrying about what they should be posting when they come back but if you are going to take a break self-impose one focus on the work focus on the art that's what i would do it says going against the grain i would pop up after a few months and do an instagram live video and invite followers to listen through to my latest creations and have a chat for an hour or two then i would disappear again it felt like the more intentional and intimate showcases made people focus on the music not on him June is, or just because you're away it creates a bit of desire as well that also is a thing on June the 2nd UK drum based artist Halogenics posted a, his concerns about social media landscape he posted I refuse to participate in the relentless game of social media driven visibility he wrote on Instagram the instant the instantaneable appetite um insatiable I don't know how you said it the insatiable yeah he wrote on Instagram, the insatiable appetite it creates to be constantly seen is destroying not only my mental health, but the core values and the qualities of music culture that I fell in love with. He also spoke with RA saying that social media sucks me into a pattern of feeling like I have to be visible in order to maintain my standing as an artist rather than creating more art. It's self-defeating. For him, the only way to solve the problem is by free, free rebalancing priorities and being present, whether with his loved ones or in the studio. I definitely agree on that one, but again, it all comes back to the art 
art i think there's way too much time i think that's the reason why some people might have issues with people like gary v he spends a lot of time telling people how to promote and push themselves on social but not a lot of time goes into the focus on actually what it takes to create good art maybe it's a given maybe in his head he's thinking hey you should know that the important thing should always be the art itself and the product of the business it shouldn't be on you know trying to finagle the business and make the numbers work for yourself of course i'm definitely sure um that is true but there is maybe an onus on some people to kind of focus too much too much too much into the whole you know making sure people kind of vibe a certain way on certain things but hey what do i know what do i know da 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 other artists have made a habit of taking regular breaks u.s veteran king brit will warn his followers that he's closed for spiritual maintenance before logging off again so corny and so lame my following knows i'm working on magic um especially when i take breaks yeah all right get off your own fucking high horse and stop sucking your own dick it's healthy the corporations um and platforms make you think that you have been on all the time but feel anonymity is a lost art the mystery and something we artists need yeah but you can just do that without you know calling it you're going away for spiritual maintenance like that is super wanky and it continues jack daney um of minnesota based trio uh trinian sound agreed organic interest is still king <laughs> audio is king word of mouth and people genuinely being interested in you and sharing your content with your friends is still the f most important so i think it's if i take a break people are still going to be there of course they are man why wouldn't they be if you're not creating good enough work that people would want to check out like there's still artists i listen to who have passed away many years ago it's not because they passed away i listen to because the work is good and they're not around to promote their work anymore so good work is good work um at the people still miss adam kimmel is a good example he's a fucking fashion designer that quit fashion industry a very long time ago maybe like 2015 or something and people still give a shit and speak his speak of his name very highly because the work he created when he was around was that strong it resonated with people that much that people still long for it till this day um so yeah at the time of speaking Dini was planning on a full social full social media detox after recently deactivating his twitter account the outspoken artist has overwhelmed with being constantly tagged by people requesting his opinion on politics and music industry hot topics oh no everyone wants my opinion people care about what i have to say they think i have some good takes the horror like honestly some of it is a lot of like some people just do need to suck up there is a lot there is a lack of resilience with some people especially in the arts which probably explains why a lot of people find it difficult to actually make it because as much as it's important to actually create good great work it's also important to have the ability to yeah you know, to, to, to withstand the many setbacks of life that throws at you especially when you're trying to pursue a career in an industry that has no protections that has no direct route to get to the top where everybody's kind of doggy dog people will stab you in the back for this and that because everybody wants prestigious positions because everybody deep down knows once you kind of get your foot in the door you got a career for life it's something people don't really speak about too often but if you're well behaved and you do the right things and you work at your craft essentially if you make it in music you essentially have a career for life if even that, if that means that you transition over doing something behind the scenes or in the studio and you stop being an artist at a certain age if you do things right you essentially get a job for life so the whole reason why people are pieces of shit does make sense but in order to survive those pieces of shit you need to have some level of resilience some willing level of you know spiritual mental metaphysical fucking fortitude to kind of see through and barrel through all this nonsense and not be so you know um, susceptible to be swayed left on right through the winds of change because you don't have a central core that's kind of anchoring you down that's what i would say so i think a lot of these people need to fucking suck it up and stop complaining really um it continues here says while he believes everyone deserves a response he also decided to disengage uh because people feel a little bit too entitled to <laughs> access wise to public figures what are you talking about who even are you man this guy's acting like he's fucking rihanna like <laughs> uh political debate can add another and honestly people want your opinions because you're outspoken and you basically welcome people's opinions or you want them to send you stuff they start sending you stuff because that's what you ask to do and then you start getting annoyed when they're sending you stuff like you need to for the most part know how to you know communicate with your fans so that they give you the things that you want but you then you can't ask them for something and then when they start doing the thing that you want then all of a sudden get annoyed and start saying no 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 i don't want that i don't want that like you did this like you did this yourself um, and also it's a good thing that they want your opinions because it means they trust and they respect what you say figure out a way to make it work um, or don't but complaining about it is lame anyway it continues in may 2020 the u.s experienced one of the most prominent civil rights movements in decades sparking protests and uproar across the world for black figures um it became an added way of having to educate people to speak up. 
Oh, the fucking self-absorption here, man, is insane. Just edu- who, who are you educating? Who are we educating? Uh, who am I educating? By proxy of just the color of my skin and where I'm from, I have to educate people on race relations. Like, don't they have eyes? <laughs> Can't they see for themselves? If you needed somebody to really educate you on civil rights issues and race issues around the world or places like Europe, places like North America, after what happened to George Floyd, if you needed another black person to come and sit you down, you probably are you know you probably have bigger issues you know to kind of deal with than the plight of the of, of black people that you don't probably know i think so personally um anyway the constant trauma puts truly uh sorry i didn't read about the bit for black public figures this came with the added way of having to educate people and speak up about current events while also being bombarded with graphic imagery of black tragedy <laughs> come on let's relax we got more we got more tragic images of fucking people being beheaded than we got black people being stopped out in the streets and stuff and a lot of the footage that we see of black people going crazy is usually a lot of ratchet behaviors and you know you know un- unfortunately um really downtrodden areas of the world where people don't really have much i understand but let's not let's not go too crazy um the constant trauma puts truly uh post truly can work on your spirit says king brit this definitely when I started to take spiritual breaks from social media. Honestly, people's people are really attached to social media in a way that I truly have never been. And I don't necessarily think this is a good way to approach as an artist. You should really have a sense of detachment or it should be like a second skin. But it shouldn't be such a point of spiritual fucking unnervingness. It shouldn't be like this. You should either be treating it like a platform you just post on, like a social, like a fucking newspaper, or it should be something that it actually lives and breathes in you and it's on you at all times, as a, or it's in you at all times, not on you at all times. But it shouldn't be some, you know, some adversarial relationship. This is bizarre. Anyway, continue. But not every artist um, has a love hate relationship with social media. Speaking openly to the public platform comes naturally to New York's Susie Analog, who said she's able to use the apps in a positive way. I use it to inform and educate my, and update myself she says i don't watch the news i use social media as a news source me too because it's faster and more granular i struggle to make content it feels forced and sometimes i have to meet people to preserve my healthy relationship with so again this muting people blocking people this i'm like honestly can't your eyes just pass stuff without being triggered by stuff you see with your eyes can't you do that maybe they can't maybe they can i don't really know um others fostering a mutually beneficial connection with social media can be daunting according to 2023 report by forbes 39 percent of people said that they feel it's addictive poor or nine percent admit they're fully addicted i've seen people solely focus on social media to blow up their careers and get to the top i need to realize they skipped a few steps and couldn't deliver when it time was right says jay sparrow yeah not really to be fair i think some people that do skip the steps and get to the top just figure it out along the way because there's not much to figure out djing and Anything that involves dance music for the most part i've always said is at the lowest rungs of art expression um the barrier for entry is super low anybody can do it if you have a bit of taste and a bit of passion um you know and a bit of drive you can also be the next whoever you know near archives out there it's not that difficult obviously talent doesn't matter but for the most part the ones who work the hardest network the best usually get to the top and sometimes if you cheat your way to the top it doesn't mean that you you know you skip steps it just means you figured out a way to get to the top quicker because there is no path there is no one way to get to places it doesn't exist um so i think this is just a bit of cope to make people feel good about themselves who try and do things the quote-unquote right way um but i don't think it's actually true to be fair there's many people at the top who don't know what they're doing in caking living well and you know sleeping like a baby at night anyway continue says creativity is at heart a form of therapy and self-satisfaction if you seek validation self-validate okay he added um, that sounds like something you hear in rich dad poor dad if you seek validation self-validate um while social media is a great tool to deliver your art it shouldn't be used as a replacement of perfecting your art we should be cutting corners we shouldn't be cutting corners and skipping important milestones or personal self-exploratory journeys within creativity i don't agree with that in the slightest that person's talking out their ass i think in general like i said you should treat social media like a platform where you get to promote um your stuff for free to a potential audience of billions um or you should treat you treat it like a second skin where it kind of is something that you can't live without but the other part of it where you treat it like an adversarial um opponent that's there to only harm you is really 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 insane in my personal opinion and maybe you should do a lot more personal self-work to try and make that um you know change or to do the necessary work to change your attitude as opposed to thinking all social media apps are evil they're not that evil as people make the seem as they are tools to promote and push yourselves out there they're not necessary like i said before listen to 
magazines, DJ Sprinkles interview on Playful magazines, they talk about essentially not ever being on social, not ever having a phone, a decision they made at the beginning of their career. Yes, they're a bit older, but still, you can do that if you want to. You don't need to partake. There's, I think the most famous person I can think of is like a head of the health. She doesn't really partake that much, although I still think secretly she runs that fan page on Instagram. But, you know, let that leave it where it is. But in general, you can not participate if you want to, but then it will require you to focus completely on the art. And I think most people just talk shit. Most people just don't do the work. They complain about all these things, but they don't do the work in promoting themselves. Because I know I work hard and I don't do the work. So if I, find, I know if I'm working hard and I'm also falling short, there are people out there who don't even come close to the levels I work hard. So they're probably not doing anything because they, you know, they're just complaining and hoping things could change in an easy way when that is not the way life is in general. But yeah, great article from RA. Anonymity is a lost art. Why some artists are taking breaks from social media. I'll put the link in the description too to check it out if you want to check it out if you want so we have to move on now and talk about the most important thing that happened um this last few days has been pharrell williams debut at louis vuitton for spring 2024 men's um i've said my piece already before how i thought that the pharrell appointment was the wrong appointment i was really looking forward to seeing somebody like a martin rose or a grace world bonner be given that platform or somebody else within that ilk um i just mostly thought about it in the terms of okay if it's going to be somebody black which is something that the people or the brass at louis vuitton were really kind of insistent on and wanting to make sure that was an actual thing and if it was super important in terms of you know continuing on that conversation and that kind of journey that Virgil was on which I've only recently learned RIP to Virgil that he was only three years into his flipping appointment at fucking um, Louis Vuitton before he unfortunately passed away so all that work he did beforehand to kind of get to that position and get that job the work that he did while he was at Louis Vuitton it felt like he put out I don't know 12 collections in three years it really is crazy to think he was only at Louis Vuitton for three years absolutely insane but in general the noises coming out from Louis V were that they were always going to kind of favor somebody um black to take that position that was the most important thing but then when we saw people like Kit Super um doing a one-off collection with Louis Vuitton myself and probably a few others were really disheartened because Kit Super fucking sucks and the collection he put out was a poor imitation of what Virgil Abloh did before and it kind of led a bad taste in most of our mouths but then a lot of us kind of moved on and kind of accepted hey um, LVMH is LVMH they're going to do what they're going to do whatever's best for their company they're going to do it um, the kind of the, the streetwear story of Virgil at Louis V kind of essentially quote unquote died with his passing so let's just let the next person who takes the reins do what they want to do with it but then out of the blue Kid Super doesn't get the role at Louis Vuitton even though he gets a chance to do it for one time which is really strange maybe it's because he won the LVMH prize one time so it kind of gave him some special privileges to get that job for that one season um, you know even though I still think him winning the LVMH prize that year was one of the greatest charities of all time up there with fucking what's his face up there with um, Macklemore you know winning album of the year over fucking Kendrick Lamar um, really heinous and if anything I've always said this before that I think you know, Kid Super winning the LVMH prize should be encouragement for everybody out there to go and chase their dreams. Doesn't matter what your dream is and to never have imposter syndrome because if somebody like that who is that average and that mediocre could get to that sort of level, um, then it obviously shows you that all that's required is just to have a good attitude and work ethic because the one thing you hear a lot about Kid Super is that he's super nice. He's a great guy. People have heard of great things to say about him. So clearly having a good attitude, working really hard is going to get you a long way in life. Anyway, long story less long. Um, for Pharrell definitely finally got the job at Louis Vuitton. I was very surprised. Um, I didn't think he'd do well there because from what I remember um, growing up, being around, you know, growing up during um, Pharrell's ascent into culture, um, I was somebody that was very kind of, you know, um, ingratiated in the kind of streetwear scene here in London and far beyond. And I kind of saw his kind of, you know, ascent from when he was doing music and then obviously permeating into the streetwear world with the work he was doing with Nigo, with Billionaire Boys Club, with Bape, with Ice Cream, then with Human Maiden, all this other stuff he was doing in between. Um, he's always been somebody that I felt like was the great person to kind of collaborate with, with small collections and collaborations and little trinkets and glasses and sun yeah, sunglasses, jewelry, watches and stuff, all those sort of things I felt like forever would always kind of you know excel at but when it comes to creating a full collection the last time he did anything great in terms of full body of quote-unquote work in terms of clothing was the times that he was doing billionaire boys club but if you remember billionaire boys club origin most of that great stuff during bbc era 
was stuff that was made um, with the collaboration and the help of Nigo and of course the graphic design flipping mastery of Skate Thing who's responsible for some of the best graphics to come out of Babe so once um, that kind of ended the way it ended and Pharrell kind of had to rely on his own team and himself the work kind of dipped and to this point I feel like you know BB's been at Boys Club is like a shadow of the brand it was beforehand and hardly anybody wears it really that's serious um, so I was a bit dubious that Pharrell could come in and create a 60 plus look collection that would resonate with people well guess what i have to eat some humble bloody pie because this spring 2024 collection that i watched live on stream the other day and i'm gonna go over again and check over the pictures was absolutely mind-blowingly good um i thought the first half of the show was a little bit not for me a little bit lackluster it kind of felt a little bit like another kim jones show for dior where there was loads of creams and greens and whatever it kind of felt like another kind of urban safari type of thing that kim jones is kind of obsessed with and i wasn't too enamored with it but once it started getting into the middle and the end section of the show suddenly the colors starting to brighten the silhouette started to get more interesting the casting started to get more interesting the bags were fucking great suddenly i was like oh my god pharrell definitely smashes one out of the park um the the show so let's go with a close straight away and go to the things that i really really adored like i said i think the first half of the show was definitely not for me in terms of the aesthetic in terms of the color palette in terms of some of the bits and pieces on it but one thing i could kind of see that really kind of resonated for me was something that i spotted in one of the articles where they said pharrell said something along the lines of using the word tweaks and i thought that was a great approach to take with being a non-traditionally trained designer not even in the sake of like you know Virgil also wasn't trained but he came from having a brand himself that he kind of built from the ground up in Off-White and doing loads of other different collaborations whereas Pharrell's always been kind of like a I'd say like the, the 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 kind of pinnacle of an influencer in that he's got a taste he's got a point of view but he also operates it from a point of view of being like a very very informed consumer so the best way to kind of approach that I would think would be to be if you be a director of a luxury fashion house would actually be to just improve improve on classic silhouettes and shapes as opposed to coming in and trying to be Alexander McQueen because you don't have the chops so why not just take your consumer brain and be like oh okay if I wanted to create if I got the keys to a Louis Vuitton factory and I wanted to create the best you know fit and suit what would it look like what would it, what would it feel like what would the finish what would the shape what, would, what you know I mean that's how you would approach it and I like that he did this because if you look throughout the entire collection there's loads of shapes and silhouettes we all know <clears throat> from blazer jackets to trench coats to shorts to button-up shirts to bomber jackets um suit ties like every shape that we kind of know without really anything crazy that's going to go you know too far out there um and again the addition of the quality of the hats the little sprinkling of little randomness here and there with these kind of mary jane shoes which i think are going to be interest interestingly um challenging for people to wear um i do like the ability of kind of mixing and kind of you know this uh, you know this masculine i guess one side of the top and then having this femininity at the bottom with these kind of frilly pop socks and these massive chunky mary jane shoes like i said i'm going to be interested to see who actually decides to wear these and give these a chance because i think you know the regular you know the regular gays are going to definitely jump onto this and make this work but i would like to see a somewhat hetero dude pull this off and make this look good i think tyler the creator would actually look good in this outfit look number 14 he'd actually swag it out but i'm interested to see how that kind of looks um the addition of these boots i think there's been a really big trend of people making these um they kind of feel like fireman boots like i have that Kanye was wearing they also kind of remind me a little bit of red wing engineered boots um where they kind of you know they come just below the knee um they're usually very very big and thick sold um very durable basically get you know the more you batter them the better they look type of a feel and i feel like many brands um this paris fashion week um and obviously milan fashion week before that have done their version of these type of boots i just think it's a thing that's in for that particular season and of course where we shorts they look great this look number 15 is also one of my favorites um a great kind of it feels like a pajama suit um with this great little hat that looks like it could be a do-rag with the straps underneath it and the thing that i think is going to be really popular are these shoes um i think 
I think Rocky was wearing them. They're these slippers that look like they got these little bear paws at the bottom of them, but essentially they're these fluffy Louboutin slipper things that I feel it would be incredibly popular with people once they eventually get inside the stores. There's loads of things I can see there. I could say that for um, this look number seventeen, another of my favorites. Um, this kind of metallic-y type of print on the jacket with I'm assuming LV kind of embossed over it. The shape of the bomber is superb. Maybe the model sells it the most, but the shape falls incredibly well because again pharrell's been wearing this these items these streetwear staples like hoodies like bomber jackets like varsity jackets like shorts like t-shirts for many many years so he knows what a great fitting bomber should look like on that body especially with the assistant of somebody like a nigo who's also assisting him um from what we've seen so far um the cactus plant flower market girl is helping and also matthew henson who used to style i'm not sure if he still does asap rocky is also involved in the styling of this collection which is definitely on point um everything here looks completely wearable and i'll be into there's a pair of shoes here look really interesting on this look number um 16 they remind me of brothel creepers which is a kind of a staple within the kind of um uh, what would you say Tokyo streetwear lexicon right that kind of Urahara Harajuku scene um, they love fucking creeper buff, buffalo creeper type shoes um, look at somebody like a Nigo even through to babe to human made he's always got a buffalo creeper-esque type of shoe involved in that collection that feels like it look number 18 has divided people on Twitter they're not liking the fisherman vibes of this but I don't really mind it with a double knee it's kind of like you know Pharrell's version of a double knee pant um, same goes for the top with these amazing big leather pockets not really too bad about these and um, we continue here some of the bags look amazing again on here that shirling jacket number 20 is really great i could see fucking um asake or burner boy wearing that thing with no top on um this denim suit on the right number look number 24 is definitely up my alley and something that i would definitely wear is this woolly hat these hats that Pharrell's created for Louis Vuitton um, are incredibly good. Um, they're really thick. I'm a big fan of wearing thick hood, uh, woolly hats. I tend to always go for balaclavas because I've got really big hair at top. So in total to have hats that kind of fit my head without looking like a condom, I wear balaclavas. But then the added benefit of wearing balaclavas is that they're usually quite long. So when you roll them up, you get this really thick effect. So if it's cold, you get the ability to have something that kind of makes your head feel warm and just style wives that just suit your head a little bit better. I think Person. even though i got a big head they work so for i did the same sort of thing if it was like with this woolly um or this beanie it looks thicker than regular ones it kind of gives it this really interesting shape so you can make it look like you know you can make it you can style it in different ways which i kind of love about it then you've also got this denim suit which is essentially you got this print the damier print it feels like um with these square dots all over the place and you essentially got it in the different blue denim fades which is a really clever way of incorporating um the lv flipping pattern in a denim suit i fucking love it personally i think that looks great I love the fit and the cut of the denim jacket. Again, it feels like it's a Nigo influence here because he's the master of kind of the cut of a perfect denim jacket because he's got one of the best, you know, personal collections of vintage Levi um, denim jackets, 101s and whatnot. I forgot what other shape there are specifically, but he's got loads of them in his collections that he kind of uses as a, you know, as a template to make his own for his own brand. So that looks absolutely incredible. You've got a look here with a kid uh, driving a fucking little gold cart with a trunks at the back as well it looks great look number 22 uh look number 25 is absolutely amazing with a long trench coat and the boots i love this um yellow and brown checkered board print on the bags i think the bags are going to do absolute bits and numbers again i'm sure it's something that they were told in-house by the team like hey we sell a lot of bags bags are our bread and butter if you smash it with the bags it doesn't actually matter what you do in terms of clothing on the runway you're going to kill it and i think he kind of did that also in that regard but he kind of did you know, he killed two birds with one stone. He kind of did what Mark Jacobs used to do at Louis Vuitton, where he'd make incredible bags, but he'd also have incredible clothes. So it kind of, you know, was killed two birds with one stone. Um, I love this look, number 27, this rugby top that looks like it's been made out of leather or something. It looks incredible. Maybe not the most, you know, um, uh, what you call it? Maybe it hasn't got the best ventilation. You might sweat your balls off of it, but I fucking love how that looks personally. Um, Again, that checkerboard print, I'm all over it. Looks absolutely fantastic. Same goes for look number 29. There's some great little loafers or slippers there. I love the fucking 
bowling shoes look at that look number 28 i'd look absolutely fantastic in it especially the fucking colors and stuff like whoever's doing the styling smashed it the the yellow glasses that yellow those round yellow frames on this guy's black skin with this tone of this blue purple hue the bright red back like it just all sits amazingly the colors on this are so good the yellow the red the you know um the blue the dark blue the navy the black whatever that kind of hue is and this green pop on these bowling shoes is great i love that again with this with this fucking um denim suit looks absolutely fantastic it looks like he's got his own version of a chore jacket there on the top that looks really great again this checkerboard print is definitely one of my favorites it kind of reminds me a little bit of a there's a vivian westwood print actually if i'm not mistaken there's a, a there's a vivian westwood um cambridge satchel and i think it was yellow i think that's why i like that print yeah there you go see there's a yellow i've got the other version that's white um oh, back over here yeah i've got this i've got i've got the white version but there's this version here that i actually wanted when i used to work at the store i was on i couldn't get it see there there's actually three colorways i didn't actually remember the brown one there's actually three colorways of it um it comes in the white which i have here and the yellow and the black and obviously the brown and the black uh but i think that print that yellow print kind of reminds me a little bit of what pharrell's doing with that checkerboard uh print that he's got going on here that print there it looks very familiar to this one over here courtesy of vivian westwood that print that's probably why i'm really a fan of it i love that maybe that's inspiration before it i'm not really too sure but it looks absolutely fantastic let's continue with that um and then also what i also liked look number 33 is great uh, again that print that damir is it damir print i'm pretty sure that's what it's called uh, with the little you know edits on them with the dots and it looks really great there that massive uh bag looks absolutely stupendous i've not seen one bag that i don't like actually uh, this hat with the little ear flaps on the head look really cool because it also looks like something that you said you could tie like a do-rag um at the back of your head which looks great amazing again nice bags um another inclination of a kind of a chore jacket with the you know excessive flares it looks like they maybe maybe these guys legs are a bit skinnier than pharrell's but because i feel like pharrell's flares you did before were a little bit too like skinny jeans with the flares at the bottom bell bottoms i feel like these are a little bit more of a relaxed fit so they look a little bit better than what pharrell was wearing oh look at this guy this uncle with his suit looks absolutely incredible i love it the casting also in this show is absolutely superb whoever would handle that look number 37 looks great i'm a big fan of that and then you've got uh push a t and look number 39 with a an incredible all leather outfit that says louis vuitton um lovers presents looks absolutely incredible with the ny logo all over it and then you've got his brother malice um also there um with the same jacket and also in blue and those snowball jacket things uh shoes that he's wearing though they, they look incredible when they walk down the runway um this white and blue checkerboard again reminds me a little bit of human made i feel like they've got this design before this beanie is definitely something that i want 100 percent uh asap rocky was wearing it it's covered in pearls and stuff so the damier squares are essentially little pearls on top of the flipping beanie so it looks absolutely incredible it's a really luxury looking version of a hat this digital print cut you know thing on the coat on look number 42 people are now accusing pharrell of copying jw anderson because he's got the same digitized type of um design for stuff that he was doing for luebe which i don't think is true um they look very different in what they were doing especially in execution what jw anderson was trying to do was essentially take a 2d image and make it 3d right it's like a 2d cut out of a hoodie but make it look like it's you know it's, it's a 3d object make it look 2d whereas this is just a graphic on a jacket that's been made to look a particular way right it's not actually you know trying to make the cut of this jacket look like a 2d shape sort of thing so it's a really strange argument online but hey people are arguing about it um again the mary jane shoes with the pop socks that's going to be a real challenge to wear for most people but i'm eager to see how people kind of incorporate them here um these boots these snowball boot type things that pharrell's been rocking all the time are really interesting too i've said before i'm really interested to see what he does in terms of footwear collaborations because we know uh, pharrell's got a long-standing relationship with adidas but 
Um, obviously, Louis Vuitton did a lot of stuff with Nike just before um, Virgil passed away. Wonder if he got the opportunity, would he want to work with Nike personally through the avenue of Louis Vuitton, or does his contract at Adidas not permit him to do so? Do you know what I mean, even though he's not working under the guise of him, Human Raid or Human Race or whatever, it's under Louis Vuitton. I'd be curious to see how that develops over time. Um, again, here, look, number 46 is fantastic. You got Dave walking the runway, which I didn't really notice at first, but Dave is there looking great in look number 47 in a classic kind of New York style, you know, bomber jacket. Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't realize, um, Stefano Pilati from Random Identities was there. He looks fantastic because he actually wears this day. See, this is where it looks where great on. I think there are some guys you can just get away with wearing skirts or kilts, right? I'd, I'd imagine like gay presenting guys like Stefano Pilati, but I, I think he also just looks good in clothes in general. He just has a FFS and he just has a fucking swag is on absolutely fucking 10,000 when it comes to what he absolutely wears on a day-to-day -day basis. But he's definitely one of my fucking style um, icons when it comes to what he wears street style wise. I wish he would be out and about in town more so you can see more of his outfits but he's definitely incredible you should definitely check out his brand called random identities it's definitely one of the most underrated ones out there although i think i checked his instagram recently he didn't have any links to it in his bio i wonder if it's like now defunct i'm not really sure what's going on but a really talented designer formerly of ysl um and just you know really amazing so he looks really great in his outfit he's got this kilt on with these great little frilly pop socks that pharrell did which kind of remind me a little bit of the michael jackson socks from years gone back um and um, then he's wearing this jacket in this damn ear print that kind of looks like a Chanel tweed jacket. It's sort of like he's kind of looked for it. And these glasses with the pearls all around the rims, um, which he's done before. I feel like he's done before, but maybe he's kind of updated him in this regard um, with uh, Louis Vuitton. Again, a great look here in terms of a denim suit. Look number 51, uh, look number 50, or leather, the fur on rook number 49 exquisite um most likely it's faux fur because you don't want to get any complaints from people but the the color um the tone the little inclined you know addition of the logos that look like they've been not sure if they've been burned in in boston I'm not sure how they've done that finish but they look absolutely incredible especially with the bag and the way he's holding them in a suit underneath brilliant oh that fucking Scott, I guess is what you call like a shawl. The same thing that he was wearing in some of the promo pictures when he took the Louis Vuitton job for real. It looked number 52, looks fantastic. I love these glasses here. They kind of remind me of the um, Dennis Rodman Oakleys that he wore or made famous um, that have the kind of, you know, they sort of have the strap that goes around your ears that come across your head. In this particular one, there's only one little pearl section that goes right on top of your head. I said before that I was kind of bored of pearls, but I think I'm going to be back into them again now, seeing what I've seen here. Um, we've got a great red outfit here. I wonder, actually, I didn't see when I was watching the show, but there's actually a suit that Skepta was wearing. It was an M65 with a matching pants that looked absolutely fantastic. I'm wondering if it's included in here too. Um, let me see. There's a good beret look here. Another nice kill. This tracksuit is absolutely banging. This is definitely going to be popular with a lot of people also. And again, those um, massive, really fluffy slippers with the bare print paws at the bottom. I thought this guy here looked like Ruigi, but it's not. Uh, look number 58 looks really great. You've got look number 59. I love the look of this, the leather jacket. The casting is so good. This guy is an OG male model. I'm pretty sure I forgot his name. But this guy, look number 59, is an OG male model. I remember seeing him in some run with before. He looks fucking fantastic. This guy, look number 60, looks absolutely great in this look also with this kilt. This look, it kind of looks relaxed. It looks like they look, this kilt looks like a pair of shorts, actually. That's what it kind of looks like. It kind of looks like a pair of shorts with just a really baggy opening. That's what it sort of looks like to me. But it looks absolutely fantastic. Big up here. Me looks absolutely great in it. Um, I love this look as well. Look number 63 with that kind of Chanel-esque um, looking jacket. That massive color of that red, you know, holder looks absolutely beautiful. As does look number 62. 61 looks great also. Oh, look at these. All these models towards the end. See, this is when the show really hotted up. The models and the casting and the styling towards the end really sold it for me. 64. Um, and 65, I'd be all over, especially 64. That jacket is absolutely banging. 
then 66 is another one a lot of fans have been spotting because this particular varsity jacket um with the pla i think on it written on the front um is definitely a jacket that Pharrell used to wear back in the day a lot um a famous jacket that he kind of pulled back in self-reference himself and put it into louis vuitton um show updated it a little bit here and there but it's essentially a little bit of a nod to kind of his history with clothes that's really cool to see that um again look at this amazing crocodile inspired jacket the major ends in this outfit look incredible actually to be fair i'd i'd rock the fuck out of these two looks look number um 68 and 69 of those mary janes like the mary janes one with regular black pants and this leather jacket is incredible um with the little water flask there and then obviously the mary janes worn um with this look look number 68 he kind of looks like a bellboy but i do like that vibe it looks really good there um, another look here with some loafers with again I think pearls or some accoutrements on the socks uh, you've got look number 70 here looks incredible as does look number 71 the end bit is definitely my favourite towards the end 72 looks great that fur jacket is great this kind of gives me a lot of Tom Ford vibes to be fair um, Tom Ford that Gucci is definitely giving me something about that, that big wide shoulders of this fur jacket the lapels are massive um, this little small bag the relaxed trouser fit the tight like everything around it feels very very much like an old school fucking Tom Ford you got the models coming out there and again you got the fucking track jacket there also but yeah this whole entire collection was absolutely banging and then throughout the end surprisingly he didn't cry I thought he would cry he didn't yeah th there's a look with the track with the outfit that i was talking to you about that skepta had on that was absolutely incredible this whole entire suit looks so good with the m65 and the trousers you got pharrell here with Naomi campbell you got jared leto there takashi you got kelly Rowland. you got zendaya anita the brazilian singer willow and Jaden smith you got offset um who else is there let's see these other celebrity pictures and shit and then kim kardashian looked an absolute mess i did megan the stallion to be fair megan the stallion looked like she was getting styled by ej the king again which she didn't but um the worst definitely fit was definitely kim kardashian she's starting to look her age father time doesn't stop for anyone and the outfit was absolutely deplorable considering what show she was at in general really really horrible but regardless final reviews um for me i definitely would give it a high eight out of ten maybe even nine especially when i consider my doubts about his you know first debut over there at louis vuitton and the fact that he smashed it and the fact that it started off a bit shaky from looks number one all the way to maybe look number i don't know it's like shaky maybe until look number 23 and the rest of it then just went another level from 24 onwards um he really smashed it ready to wear is incredible accessories looks great footwear looks amazing also um and i think it's going to do absolute numbers once it finally gets in store and it's a great platform for him to kind of go on and tell an interesting story with the collection he has going forward so i'm really am um, pleased to see this and i can't wait to see what some of this stuff looks like in person and what's going to sell what's not going to sell and stuff and how the conversation progresses but in, in terms of other things look at a bit more critically if you're a fashion student i guess it's somewhat a little bit disconcerting to see somebody that comes from music who has no formal training whatsoever and who kind of is known as somebody that kind of you know maybe thrives within a collaborative space where they need to create small capsule collections be given the reins at a luxury house like flipping louis vuitton with all their resources to create a full fashion collection it can be it can kind of you know um bum you out a little bit but i also think Maybe going forward, considering what's been happening with some of these kind of, um, you know, um, I guess with some of these hires that's been happening recently, where these big luxury houses have been trying to tap into young up and coming designers to try and modernize their brand and welcome new, you know, um, fans to them, whatever it may be. And it kind of ending in absolute tatters with the recent expulsion of Rigi from Bali or Bali, however you pronounce it. And the other one with um, Ludovic over there at Flippin' and De La Musta and that having those issues over there. I think there's definitely something to be, needs to be said for maybe these brands deciding instead of going for young up and coming people who they're not going to nurture and protect because, you know, they number one, they don't feel like they do their due diligence anyway. 
I feel like the Ruigi issue being a good one. Once the story came out about him that he's being sued by one of his, um, you know, investors in a brand, suddenly everybody on social media had stories to tell about Ruigi scamming and being a bit dodgy from day dot. So if that's the case and everybody knew it was an open secret, Baddy should have done their research before hiring him personally and never gave him the job in, in fact. Or if they were going to hire him, know that the baggage he comes with. But deciding after the fact, um, you know, to then fire somebody because you think they're going to be bad for PR is really gross because eventually that could really harm the person's career trajectory and you've kind of wasted their time and you've done it your brand in the process so a lot of these brands aren't doing the due diligence necessary they're very risk adverse they don't want any bad blowback maybe it's because of what happened with john galliano and stuff i'm not really too sure but the era of the rock star kind of you know disruptor bad boy bad girl designer is completely gone they want safe options if that's the case maybe hiring people like pharrell and doing that for future appointments is the way to go if you can't hire somebody that's super experienced if you can't get mark jacobs to come and take over that kind of ilk of a designer and you have to go for somebody um maybe you know maybe that's available whatever maybe with less experience maybe going with somebody that is an influencer in that space or somebody that can work well in a collaborative team might be the best way to go about it because you get the ability to have somebody with star power in that role you have the ability to have their contact book open to you because you know i don't think louis vuitton are able to book a jay-z have all those people fly and attend the show if they don't have a virgil if they don't have a pharrell those people are going to be the ones that are going to bring the people um and the culture to your show so that definitely works um so that obviously is a good thing and then you also have the ability to keep intact your creative design team who you trust because they've been the bedrock of the brand for many many years to basically work with this main person to bring their dreams true because or to fruition because they don't have any experience of kind of doing it themselves so you kind of you know are able to kind of keep the same team without having to expend uh, on new salaries on new people every time you hire in a new creative director who's got different ideas than the last one so that might be a good way to go about doing things it's a sort of like a fail safe version then what you do is that you tell the youngsters coming up graduating from uni hey instead of trying to come here to be a career director why don't you come here and try and work behind the scenes being a seamstress being a pattern cutter working in fabrication working in materials working in ideation whatever it may be called right just behind the scenes stuff and work your way up that way and then once you get the experience necessary and you feel the urge you can go out and launch your own brand but coming here with the proviso of just being a career director might be the best one way to go about things or you could even end up doing like an alessandro Bichelli where you work at a brand for a very long time and then once the opening comes available they might recommend you for the top spot if that opening is there but maybe this is the way to go forward maybe more of these houses should be hiring you know influential people in culture to take those roles especially with a star power because they know they are safe options especially the ones that are a little bit more experienced um in the industry long in the tooth like a pharrell um have been there done that who can work well with corporations work well with others can play the game very well as pharrell can you know he's kind of like the opposite of kanye in that regard he knows how to kind of play the game well and p appear polite appear humble while also being a complete savage behind the scenes and also having the ability to execute at a really high level that probably is the way to go about things but like i said i could also understand if you're at st martin's if you're at westminster if you have all these fashion colleges parsons whatever it may be called and you're seeing pharrell out there trot out that collection it can maybe you know be a bit demoralizing because you know more than likely it means that the possibility of you ending up there at the top helm isn't really within your grasp but the benefit of it is that it does expose um, the industry to people and show that, hey, most of these big brands, you know, they don't really need you to know how to pan cut um, in order to have that job. And um, they have people in the studio, in those places that know how to do that stuff. What they need you to do is to kind of steer the ship and kind of give an overall direction and then things can go from that way. So that's definitely where that kind of comes from. So it was great to kind of see that from Flo in that regard. But regardless, really impressed with the collection. Loved it all. The only thing I hated actually, to be honest, was the choir um i think i'm over the fucking black choir thing um the spirituality of it all that nonsense luckily it wasn't the sunday service choir because that choir is fucking garbage i don't care what anyone says hearing those little kids screeching and wailing is annoying hearing regular people try and turn fucking gospel songs into house anthems is awful i hate it so at least they weren't that bad but still i'm kind of over it but the beats regardless of it once i beat kitten from pharrell that four that four bar count that doo -doo 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 -doo, that layered drum pattern oof, that was absolutely hard i was bopping my head all along with it but the gospel stuff enough of that please enough of that free tricks but overall loved it loved it loved it anyway that has been the excellent show episode number six 
87, I think. Thanks so much for tuning in. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube and all that malarkey, you know what to do. Smash a like, share it, leave a comment down below. That'd be greatly appreciated. If you listen via the podcast app, don't do anything because there's probably my song of the day playing right underneath my voice now as I'm speaking. So all you need to do is leave me a fast start review and share the show. That's all you need to do. Um, links regarding myself are in the description if you need those. And I'll be seeing you guys again very, very soon. But for now, take care and be safe. Peace.